Hey everybody, I'm Andy Smith. I'm a 30 year comic book veteran, having worked for Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Image Comics, Cross Generation, Ominous Press, you name it, I've probably worked for them. And I do other things art wise outside of comics in the field of advertising. I've also written some books on drawing comics you might have seen, uh, drawing American manga superheroes, Drawing Dynamic Comics was my first book. And I also did the handy little How to Draw Superhero sketchbook where all you need is a pencil because you do all the work right inside the book. Enough about that. This is the Book Look series. The Book Look series is where I grab a book off my library. You can see the tons of books I have behind me. And I go through it page by page with you so you can see if it's a book that you might want to buy. I like to know what I want to buy before I buy it, and I feel this is a way to give you some insight into these books. So join me for today's book look. Thanks. Hello, everybody. It is Andy Smith, your host with the most, with another book look the week before Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. The Art of Plug. Michael Plug is his full name. I picked this up last weekend at the Charlotte Comic Con. This is a $50 book and I got it for 30 bucks, I believe, from a dealer, Carl. We call him Big Carl. Carl is seven feet, three inches tall, I believe. He's a big dude. He has a lot of great stuff. I had to get this. Um, I wasn't looking to buy stuff like this at that convention, but God, for the deal, I had to. Uh, beautiful spread here. Uh, Mike Plug hasn't did. Mike Plug made a made a huge mark in comic books, but didn't do a ton of comic book work. Known for mostly horror stuff, this is from Frankenstein that he did for Marvel. Beautiful watercolor paintings and um, uh, oil paintings. This book really goes through chronologically in his career. Uh, Plug was born in 1940. Look at that guy. Look at him. Um, this, this book is, it's huge for one. I mean, this book is, what are we looking at here? 350 some pages. Uh, this is some of his early art. So it talks about how he went into the service. He worked on PS Magazine, which is a kind of an instructional magazine. Here's some here that Will Eisner did. And it kind of was, it was, it was an instructional magazine on how to repair and do stuff. And Will did the art for it. Mike Plug did art for it. Joe Kubert later took over doing it. And uh, you can actually find some of them on eBay. This is some of Mike's work. Mike has a big uh, Will Eisner influence in his work. Um, here he is here in 1970, 30 years old, uh, his original uh, visualization for Ghost Rider there. Let's do this. Let's get to some of the art. A lot of this book is art, which of course I love. So comics. Yeah. Um, very nice. This is for Hot Rod Cartoons. Uh, very Jack Davis feel. He says he was influenced by Jack Davis. I mean, Jack Davis, great cartoonist. You can really see that more in these drawings than you do in uh, later on where his Will Eisner influence really comes through. But I mean, there's so much. Like, I never even knew he did stuff in that, that magazine. Uh, Eerie, he did work for Eerie, horror, that's what you kind of uh, think of when you think of Plug as horror stuff. Brand of Frankenstein, very Will Eisner-esque face right there, just the way he does the clothing and the lighting and stuff. Never knew about this, Vamprella number 14, page one. I might actually try and find this magazine, you know, honestly, I never thought of Plug as, uh, uh, somebody that drew very attractive women and nothing against them. But I mean, that's just not what I think he's known for. But I mean, this figure Vamparella here is very saucy. I love how these are all shot from their original art. 
I don't think this is stuff Mike owns anymore. But like this, the wrinkles in the clothing, the way he does uh, the, the, the liquid, the rain dripping off, very Will Eisner, the, just the posing of everything. Of course, I talked to Aaron Lepresti about this book, and Aaron has it. You know, he went to Marvel, showed his work around, and they were like, eh, we don't know. Your work doesn't really fit what we do. And then he got a call uh, about doing a, a werewolf book, and it was Werewolf by Night. And um, later in the book, I believe it says, Mike never got his art back for issues one through five, which is just a shame. Uh, I was talking to Aaron about it and Graham Nolan, and they said that he eventually did get his art back since this book was published. And this book was published like five years ago or so, or eight years ago, 2015. He did get his art to number one back. Uh, it's a shame. I wouldn't mind getting number one of this book, but because of the TV stuff and all that, it's really gone up in value out of my price range. But I love that cover for number three, so I might see if I can get number three. I think that would be a fun one to have. Here's some art from uh, Marvel Spotlight, where uh, Werewolf by Night first debuted. This is all Marvel Spotlight art. I love this time period. This is uh, 1971, so Mike was like 31 when he was drawing this stuff. Love the shadows and the brushwork. A lot of thick brushwork here, which I really like. This is not the greatest scan at all. I'm not quite sure I would have included this in the book. It's really, it's not from the original. It just, a lot of line work dropped out. But then you see stuff like this, which is a uh, very nice uh, shot from the artwork. I love seeing paste ups and stuff. Another one, this is definitely better than the previous one, but uh, still not shot from an original. I almost, I know it's a cover, but I almost would rather have seen this as a full page because it is shot from the original. Anyhow, just moving on, there's the cover for number one. Later in the book, you will see that he, uh, he actually recreated a bunch of these covers as watercolor paintings. Um, and they're just, his watercolor work is gorgeous. He mentions that he got a job uh, I think it was in the early 90s, he was offered a job to do a card set, fully painted. And he said up until that point, he never really did fully paintings before. And he he was able to get out all these paintings and he switched from doing watercolor with ink to full oils. And he basically said that card set is what taught him how to paint. You know, and sometimes it's a good thing just to say yes to a job and then figure out how you're going to do it after you get it. And it really puts you under the pressure to, to perform and do it. Uh, this is the cover I'm talking about. I really like the twist on him. It looks like an interesting story. Uh, the Mystery of the Mad Monk. <laughs> uh, Mike wasn't inking himself. Frank Chiramonte was. Eh, not a bad combination. I, of course, would prefer pure plug, like on the covers. Third thing, too, is I love seeing the blue pencil. And a part of me, I know Aaron does a lot of work with blue pencil when he pencils stuff. And I wonder if he picked that up from uh, from Plug or not. This is uh, Werewolf by Night number... This is five. Oh, page one. So he did ink all of issue five. I might get this one. May... 5 May, my daughter was born on May 5th. I like collecting books that have that. So I might pick that one up and Mike inked it all. So, so you know, moving on, uh, this is a thick book. I want to keep these videos shorter for you guys, you know, 20 minutes or so. This book could take a long time to go through. Jim Mooney, very nice. Love the motion of that tiger. I mean, Mike is just a great, great cartoonist. I would love to have seen him draw an issue of Swamp Thing. Um, he did, I believe it was the Sludge Christmas special, if I'm not mistaken. And I think Mark Farmer inked it. Uh, that's a book I thought I had, and I was looking. I can't find it. So I definitely, I want to go out and get it. 
Uh, there's also a painting in here from that card set I was talking about that Aaron owns. So when we get to it, I'll point it out and you guys can see it. Uh, Mike did the inking on this. Uh, one of the few things he actually inked over somebody else, and it was with the Beast. Uh, Tom Sutton did the pencils, Plug did the inks, Plug's inks. And even back then, inking was more of a skill craft where... You know, you see a lot of plug in this finish, and, you know, if you didn't tell me Tom Sutton drew it, I would assume it was all plug. This is cool. This is his character concept artwork for Ghost Rider. It's funny, it says in here when he was offered Ghost Rider to create, he thought it was the Ghost Rider Western, and he was so excited. Then he found out it was this dude riding a motorcycle. Um, but still, Mike Plug, co-creator of Ghost Rider. This is what I'm talking about. This is tight pencils for back then. 1972. This is what tight pencils look like. Uh, a lot of inkers these days, no offense, are more like tracers where they know how to use the tools and pull, pull nice lines, but it's because the pencils are so tight. I would love to see this inked by a variety of different anchors because you would definitely see uh, the variety of style that an anchor can bring to a book. Uh, this is, I believe, his first appearance here. Uh, Mike Plug pencils and inks. This was reprinted. I have the reprint. No way could I probably afford. Uh, I probably could afford it, but I'm good with the reprint. Love that. Love the design. I was lucky enough in my career to draw one Ghost Rider cover, and I think it was over a reprint of a Mike Plug book. I'll have to look. So Ghost Rider, very cool. Uh, jumping ahead here. Uh, let's see. That's just cool. This was from 1992. 20 years after I did my last issue of Ghost Rider, uh, he did this cover, a series that reprinted those original 70s stories. It's really cool to be able to come back and see somebody revisit uh, their stuff. And the book that I did the cover for was for the original Ghost Rider. Um, I'll have to try and find it and show you guys. So other stuff here, uh, Doctor Strange stories. Uh, he did covers for, not sure if he did the insides. And then, of course, The Monster of Frankenstein. Now, I never read any of these. I was asking Dennis if he did. And he just wasn't into that type of stuff. So I'll have to ask Aaron about it. Because I'm sure Aaron did to see if he thinks the stories are good. Because, I don't know, something about it. I, I think it'd be kind of fun to read. His character sheet for Frankenstein, just something else. It looks like it'd be just a blast uh, to ink. Love this cover for number one. Uh, this is uh, page one of number one. Looks like it was shot from their original. And then this section just goes through showing the different covers and page ones of it. Uh, I hear this book goes for a good amount on eBay. I think Aaron told me it was a Kickstarter when it originally came out. Um, he did Frankenstein number six. I want to try and track down because the whole issue was shot from his pencils. So it'd be interesting to see how well the reproduction came out. Kung Fu. -y. You can see more of his Jack Davis influence here. For Crazy Magazine, other stuff I never knew he did. Shafted, very cool. Uh, the Tattletale Heart, great likenesses too. Um, then he did some call issues, and I bought this issue. Aaron showed this on a live stream. Um, I bought this as soon as I saw this splash page. I was like, this book was cheap, didn't, you know, five bucks maybe. I had to buy this. I mean, just look at that figure. Just the exaggeration in it. Is it anatomically correct? Hell no. But is it freaking cool looking? Hell yes. And uh, he did the inks on it himself. Uh, some of the other issues of the book, I believe he did uh, just pencils on. Yeah, here's number 12. Uh, Sal Buscema did the inking, which is great. And you can see it. You can see Sal's inks in this work. Um, these are just reprinted from the comics. I love this coloring. This is number 13. 
inked by Al Milgram. Love that. Uh, Jack Abel. Love Jack Abel's inks. So I might actually try and hunt down these issues to own. Then he did some, oh, this was unused experimental. Uh, looks like graphite and then some gray wash and whiteout and stuff. He did work in the black and white Savage Sword of Conan, uh, number 34. They did a great job in this book telling you what the work is from. So if you want to hunt it down, it's not that difficult. Uh, very cool looking there. Great tonal work he was doing since it was a black and white magazine. Then we get to the man thing. I accidentally said, talking to somebody, um, I, I was at my daughter's eye appointment and I was reading through this and a guy that works there came up and said, what is that book? I love that art. And I told him, and I was trying to explain to him who Mike Plue was, and I accidentally said he co-created the man thing, which I know he didn't, but I was on the spot, guys. But I think he drew one of the one of the most iconic uh, man thing images uh, there is. I wouldn't mind trying to get a number one. I do want to get this number five because it's May 5, like my daughter's. Uh, I like this cover, number eight, kind of has that Frankenstein vibe feel that he did. And here it is. Oh, there you go. May 5. Actually, this one, this is the original unpublished version. And if you look at it on the previous page and compare it, I wish the previous one was bigger. The man thing's actually bulkier. He's thinner here, and here he's a lot thicker. And I think that's how the man thing should be. I got to draw the man thing in an issue of Quasar. So that was fun. Just love it. I like you know, I like the Swamp Thing. I like I like all these type of characters. Obviously, Aaron does. He co-created the Sludge. And then, of course, his own Garbage Man is in this vein. So some of this stuff is great. I love seeing the whiteout and stuff here. Uh, I didn't know he worked on the Planet of the Apes magazine. So this was new to me. Did not know that. Um, some of this stuff was just shot from pencil as well. So once again, pretty experimental on this stuff. And then, this is crazy. He took a page from it and just for fun, added watercolor to it. So I don't know if somebody owns this or if he still owns it, but that's, that's a rarity right there for sure. And it just reprints some of the nice work, grayscale stuff he did. Back to doing some just pencil work for it. Uh, this is cool. This was for a calendar piece from the Mighty Marvel calendar for 1975. I think I own that calendar. I need to look. I love it. It just, you know, Werewolf by Night, Dracula, Man-Thing, Frankenstein. So cool. And I found out in this, he drew one issue of Conan. I did not know that. So now I need to hunt down issue 57 of Conan. Uh, I also didn't know he drew the Weird World stuff, and this is really cool. This was printed in this Marvel Fanfare uh, 24, inked by P. Craig Russell. Now, you want to talk about an interesting team-up. That This is it right here. Uh, they only showed that one page. I wish they would have showed more. Uh, he did covers for Lone Wolf and Cub. I did not know that either. Uh, this I did know. I own this book. I bought this book, uh, not when it came out, but probably 20, 25 years ago. You want to talk about how to draw kids, great cartooning, great character acting. You don't even need the word balloons. This is it. He did pencils, inks, written, wrote the adaptation, and did the watercolors on it. Uh, I would love to know the process if he watercolored it and then inked it. Uh, Aaron might know, or if he inked it and then watercolored it. I'm just curious, because if you have to use whiteout, uh, doing watercolor over whiteout um, doesn't work that well. Beautiful piece here. Um, he did The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. I don't own this book, but I want to get it. I do have one uh, Santa Claus adaptation. I'm actually looking at my bookshelf now. Uh, trying to figure out where it is, but it's the one Bill Sienkiewicz did. I don't have this one, but it is one I definitely want to uh, hunt down and get. I mean, look at this. Just great cartooning. Once again, beautiful watercolored original art. 
Um, I didn't meet him. He never came by CrossGen that I recall. Maybe he did. Um, but he did do, CrossGen did publish a Badiz ad, which he teamed up with J.M. Uh, DiMatteis on as the writer. Very cool, very fun, Wizard of Oz-esque. Um, Disney ended up buying uh, all of CrossGen stuff when the company went down for, I think, just like a little over a million bucks. And from what I heard, they only bought it because they wanted a bad as ad. And uh, that was a great deal that they got because they did get everything else. And as you can see, Marvel's publishing the stuff. They just put out a sigil omnibus featuring all the issues of sigil. Um, I did two issues in it. So I don't expect to get one as a complimentary copy because I only drew two issues. It would be nice. Uh, if I can ever find it for like half off, I might buy it. Then he did the Stardust Kid through Boom Studios uh, with JMD Mateus. The Stardust Kid was another of his creations filled with worlds of extremely visual characters. Um, and this is all comic stuff. So it's not through continuity of his career because... Uh, for most of the 80s and a lot of the 90s, he didn't do a lot of comic stuff. He did movie work, and he did movie work on films I never even knew he worked on. Um, when DC was publishing The Spirit, he did uh, issues 9, 14, 31, and 32. I had no idea. I will have to look for these. These are probably the closest thing you can get to Will Eisner drawing The Spirit. Thicker Than Blood, I did a book look of. Uh, just recently, I did have this. I got the black and white version. Um, I do want to get the issues. I know I can get them off eBay. Simon Bisley actually did the colors on the limited series, it, how it was originally published. I got the black and white graphic novel. Uh, comic paintings. This is what I'm talking about. He went back and took some of his most famous covers and redid them as paintings. I assume he sold these. Uh, this is from the year 2000, so he was 60 years old when he did these. I love the watercolor technique on these. Just great stuff. Here's the cover I'm talking about. Number, uh, I think it was number five. Oh, no, number four. Oh, no, number three. I do want to get this actual issue. God, I love that painting right there. The watercolors, the way he uses them, look vibrant. They almost look like dyes, but they're not. So he does a nice pencil drawing first, and from the pencil tonal drawing, um, he does the watercolor. Now, I think these are two separate pieces of work. So this is the prelim, and then from the prelim, he might trace it off and then ink it and then keep this by his side for the tonal work so he knows where the, you know, uh, the tonal values go when he's doing the final painting. Just great stuff here. I mean, look, at I had no idea he did this many. He did Ghost Rider. His work is just so animated. Here we go, the cover of number one redone. Marvel should have reprinted all these books with these covers that he painted. I think they, uh, they would have done very well. Frankenstein, that, that call issue I own. Love that painting. Just great, great stuff. And then we get into, hold on, did I, yep, films. So he worked with Ralph Bakshi, who I did know he worked on The Wizards with him. So that wasn't a revelation to me. A lot of character design stuff. He was doing Lord of the Rings he worked on. I knew that as well. That's just so cool. Love this. Oh, man. Just great. Great atmosphere and stuff. But he did do storyboards as well. A little more than halfway. This is one I didn't know. I did not know he did storyboards for Superman 3. No freaking clue he did that. Love it. Love seeing these storyboards. Um, this is for uh, Escape... Well, I don't think it was called Escaping the Misfits. What was this called? Caveman, 1981. Never even heard of it. Heavy Metal, knew about that one. The Thing, 1982. Uh, I, I've seen the movie, liked it. 
creepy, you know, remake. Um, I didn't know he did visual design work and stuff on it to the extent of showing how uh, some of the special effects stuff could be done. Very cool. So well thought out. I mean, and these boards, you know, if you watch the movie and compare them to the boards, just right on. Great stuff. Once again, I don't know. I wonder if he owns these originals. It would have been a nice little tidbit in this book to say. So a lot of the boards for the thing. Uh, Frank Oz he worked with. It's great, the little excerpts that the guys like Oz and Bakshi and stuff say about him. Uh, Return to Oz, didn't know he did that. So, you know, Plug drops out of the comic spotlight and people are like, wow, what's the guy doing? Did he make so much money in comics? No, he just jumped over to movies where uh, he got paid a lot better. Um, young Sherlock, I didn't know he worked on Little Shop of Horrors. Storyboards for that, design work super cool. This is a movie I never watched the whole thing. I know Steve Martin's in it. I love Steve Martin, but I don't know, the movie just didn't work for me. Um, he was actually going to try and play a part, the part of Mr. Big in this movie Moonwalker, but uh, let's see, the role was given to Joe Pesci. So, uh, wow, the things you learn. Uh, worked on The Witches, that's 1990. Titan AE, I remember Titan AE. No clue that he worked on it. So just learning so much. This is awesome. He did this sequence rendered in colored pencil on black craft paper. I mean, I don't even know how you would get, you know, I assume he did prelim drawing something on regular paper and then transferred them to this paper. Uh, maybe using like a color transfer paper. I don't know, but man, what a cool effect. X-Men. I had no clue he did storyboards on freaking X-Men. The first X-Men movie. That is something I'm sure Aaron knows because he has this book. But before this book, I don't know if Aaron even knew that. Shrek. Shrek. I didn't know he worked on Shrek. Just insane. And just the... the the variety and the 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 breadth uh, breadth of whatever of his work. Look at this beautiful, beautiful animation. You get the feeling of such movement from this cartooning. This great village and castle. Uh, K nineteen, the Widowmaker. I didn't know he worked on that. I mean, just fantastic. Didn't know he worked on Lord Croft Tomb Raider. I mean, so much film work. Fantasy art painting. This is what I was talking about. Uh, these were all created over a 14-month span for a fantasy art trading card series. 1993, so 53 years old, a year younger than me. Uh, Mike Friedrich asked him to do this. And he asked if he wanted to create 90 new paintings for a series dedicated to his work. Mike Plug's work. Uh, he said, how hard could it be? Ha, but actually, up until that point, I had done less than 10 paintings in my entire life. Hell, I've done more than 10 paintings at that point in my life. So he said, he asked if it would be okay if he inked them and then did them with watercolor. Uh, Friedrich said, absolutely. And then as he got going on it, he said, I'm not joking. I literally learned to paint creating these 90 cards. And he said about halfway through, he did the jump and started doing them in oils. This doesn't show all 90. Uh, this is a card set I would love to get. But it shows a good variety of them. So here's ink and watercolor to show that. Um, this looks like that as well. But then over here, this is oil painting. And oils, I mean, I like working in oils the few times I have. They just take forever to dry. Uh, now they make actually water-soluble water uh, oil paint, which is just great because you don't have to use turpentine and stuff and deal with the fumes. Beautiful oil painting here. Um, this is what I was telling you about. This is the cover. Good Lord, I love that. When the guy saw the cover when I was sitting in the waiting room reading this, he thought it was Frazetta. Um, beautiful there. 
Uh, this is where we'll see the, the painting, Aaron Lepresti. Man, just love that. I love the oil painting work he did. I really wonder if he owns these originals. Uh, I know of one he doesn't own. It's the one Aaron owns. So I, I have gotten to see one of Plug's original paintings in uh, person. Love this. Guy has human heads hanging here. That's watercolor. This one's oil. Just great color sense leading the eye around the images. Great cartooning. This is one of my favorites. Nice warm in the foreground, cool colors in the background. And this is it, guys. I'll stay on this page for you. This is the painting that Aaron Lepresti owns. I know he has showed it on streams before. Love this. You can totally see Aaron is uh, influenced by Plug and his watercolor paintings and such. Just love this so much. Collectible card games. So he, he did trading cards for, I believe, magic and stuff. Here's all his nice pencil drawings for tonal purposes he did beforehand. And then you see some of the nice paintings he did that are reduced down to card size. I mean, I'd love to know what the original size of this art was. Um, it could be this big. It could be this big. I'm assuming it's probably at least this big, but then shot down to card size. I just love this. I love this because you can see the texture of the canvas that he was painting on. So just really, really great stuff. I mean, I had no idea, honestly, Plug did this much stuff until getting this book. This is just awesome. Barbarian looking dude there. Love the just guys. If you're a Plug fan, check eBay. See if the, see what this book is going for. Look at this. Look how big this is. This could be original size. Once again, I don't know. And then it gets down to trading card size. And this is a little smaller than a trading card right here. Uh, let me let me see. I got a trading card we can match up. I mean, it's not that much smaller than a trading card. So to see it get reduced down that much, wow, is all I got to say. Just crazy that much detail and work to be shot down that small. And then he did a book called Goliath. Began in winter in 1999, so when he was almost 60. Um... Oh, look at this. Tell me he's not a Frazetta fan. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, Goliath, I think. I don't know much about it. I, I, I've, I recognize the artwork, so I have seen it. It's something I'll have to do a search for and uh, possibly buy. Love that gorilla. Just the cartooniness of these characters. And then this, just great watercolor painting. And this, oh. so this is the image I know I've seen before. So I will have to do a search on that. That's just, just great stuff right there. Beautiful stuff. And then we end with a nice uh, zoom in of a, a piece of art from Frankenstein. You can still see the pencil line underneath it and stuff. And I love the way he did the wraps around the figure. This stippling back here is just crazy intense. So uh, there you go, guys. Mike Plug book, uh, originally 50 bucks. I got it for a song for 30. I want to say it goes for more than that on eBay. You'll have to check. Here it is, guys. My one and only time I drew Ghost Rider. I told you I did a cover for the original Ghost Rider. This is issue 16. I don't think uh, Plug drew this book. So these were all reprints. So let's see. Uh, nope. This is Jim Mooney and Sal Trapini. Uh, I'm reading an indicia here just to see if it says when it was originally. What issue it is a reprint. It says... Oh, let's see. Reprint copyright 1974. Ghost Rider number eight. So good to know. He didn't stay on Ghost Rider that long. This is from Ghost Rider number eight. 
Um, I'll, I gotta take this down and, and read it. So I don't actually want to ruin it. I've never read this, but there you go. So I did do a Ghost Rider cover. Guys, I actually stole on this cover, believe it or not. So uh, there you go. 1993. Whoa. 30 years ago. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me on this book look of The Art of Plug. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, go check out Nice and Tight, the comic book pencil art of Andy Smith. That's me. It's a 60-page book. Guys, we're so close to $6,000. The next stretch goal, which makes it a 64-page book, it's not even funny. Go check it out. Here's the trailer. Like, subscribe, share. I will catch you guys in probably two weeks. Next Tuesday's the day after Christmas. Probably won't have a book look. Till the first week in January. Thank you guys so much. Have a Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Happy New Year. Be safe. Be happy. Read some comics. Look at some great art. Do what makes you happy. I'll talk to you guys later. Nice and tight. The comic book pencil art of Andy Smith. That's me. This book features 52 pages of some of my favorite full pencils that I did for other companies over the past two decades. The raw pencils as they were seen by the inker and now you can see them for the first time. This book also comes in a digital format so you can practice your inking in your favorite program. Back it today.